Welcome to our study in the book of Philemon. Uh, Lord willing, we will be recording the entire chapter, which is the entire book uh, in this setting. I invite you to watch the introduction if you have not done so. It will give you some excellent information as we, as we head into this study. I also trust and my prayer is that I whet your ap appetite for digging deeper into the Word of God. And I'll give you some good, some good information, good application, and good spiritual truth. But there's plenty of that to go around and uh, go digging for uh, God's treasure. All right, so the first recording is the introduction. This is the Bible study. And this is the outline we'll be using. Um, the recipient, the relationship, a request. Uh, there's the reality of the matters, and then finally it closes with respect. 25 powerful verses. And so here's the recipient, and this is not hard. Uh, it is Philemon, who this letter is written to. And I may comment as I go ahead and turn to the first verse, and you're looking at that, that this book is a companion to the book of Colossians. Uh, Philemon is a wealthy person whose home he has opened up that houses the church at Colossae. And so these are, this is a duet. Uh, one letter is written to the church, and then one is written to a very wealthy brother in Christ, Philemon, about one of his uh, servants that had run away and had, Paul had led him to the Lord, and, there he, and he is returning back again. So that is that relationship that Paul has with Philemon. And so we'll get into some good things here. Um, and uh, may God bless us as we go. Here we go. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. And there's some definitions of some of these men's names, uh, actually three of them. Onesimus will come up a little bit later on. When Paul says that he is a prisoner, he's captive, he's bound in bonds, and he, at this writing, is in prison in Rome. When he calls Philemon a fellow laborer, he's talking about you are a companion in, in the work of God. You work right alongside of me. I will work with you, and we're, we're all in this together. And to, and it continues, and to our beloved Aphia, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. And so here's some very interesting relationships, and they're established at the end of Colossians. Aphia was married to Philemon, and Archippus was their son. When Epaphras, the pastor of this church, was away or he was in prison at a point, Archippus is the one that Colossians tells us takes over and helps out as, as being the pastor till Epaphras can get back. And once again, we had a fellow laborer. Now we have fellow soldiers. And again, these are associates and laborers and in conflict. So um, when you get really into war, Everybody, you know, the soldiers work together. Uh, I'm, I'm not any better than you, and let's fight and let's defeat the enemy. Let's get going. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians starts out in a very familiar fashion, talking about the grace of God. And uh, that is what is at the beginning, and that's what is at the end. We looked at that at Colossians. We also read concerning a relationship as we started. I thank God, my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. Colossian, in Colossians opened with Paul writing to the church. He says, I thank the Lord for you. I have thanksgiving in my heart. I pray that you have it. And he said, I, I remember you in my prayers but pray for me. Paul went on to ask for that later on. But we're seeing, we're seeing what was good for the church was for, good for the man whose home housed the church, that once again, we serve the Lord together. And uh, there, there are things far more valuable 
than things that we can touch. The word prayers here, making mention of your prayers, are addresses to God, or actually, in the, the Jews would understand this, the Christian Jews as well as the other Jews would understand this as a place set aside for open prayer, like in the synagogue. So he said, if you're in the church, if you're just praying by yourself, or if you happen to see the synagogue, if you feel led, go in there and pray for me. Hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Uh, there's some really good things uh, that went on in this church and that's the, the spiritual traits that is in Philemon that Paul writes about. He has love and faith towards the Lord, but he also has love and faith in the people. And they are, they are to the church. And so you have, you have Paul praying and you have Philemon serving and uh, has, a, has a great heart. That, okay, so he goes on to say, first of all, he says, um, I hear about your love and your faith. And he says also that the, that or in order that the communication of your faith may become effectual or productive or very active by the knowledge or the, perfect, or the precise or correct knowledge of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So what he's communicating is this, that in order that, that the work of God and the, the, the speaking, especially the communication and the sharing of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is very plain and is very effective. And uh, he wants to, and he writes to him and says, make sure that I am speaking to you. I'm going to speak to you very effectively and so that we can understand it and be on the same page. For we have, here's wonderful, Paul all of a sudden includes him with Philemon, uh, for we have great joy and consolation. Actually, this is great joy and great consolation in your love. And consolation is comfort or encouragement because the hearts of the saints are refreshed by you, brother. And so he's talking about, I hear word back at the church that, that you are a blessing to the people, that it, there's great joy there and I joy in it because you are re, of a refreshing spirit and a refreshing brother in the work of the Lord. You bring comfort, you bring encouragement, you bring well dones to the worship and to the Christians in Colossae. All right, now the bulk of this is the request, and the request is all about forgiveness, and that's what this, this chapter, this book is all about. It's about forgiveness and big forgiveness in some ways. And so Paul is literally is going to talk to him bluntly, but with with a servant's heart, out of great love and great compassion, because he's talking to a brother that has exhibited great compassion and has a big heart. So let's get into these, and some of these I'll be able to just read the verse without comment, but others, is, others are going to just dictate that we stop and think about this. And so the very first one of this verse of this section is one of those. Wherefore is really therefore. Therefore, because that means because of what I've just said to you. He says, though I might be bold, much bold or much freedom in speaking to enjoin you, that which is required or one's duty or fitting. So Paul was getting ready to talk to him and say, I, I don't want to come across as somebody with a just out of the blue hitting you with something that is totally not, cannot be done, accomplished. And I don't want to act as if I'm bigger or better in Christ than you are. So because of what I've said, I want to speak freely with you from my heart. And it's my duty that I do so. Yet, for love's sake, I rather beseech you. I beg you. I come to you as your servant. 
being such a one as Paul the aged. Now Paul of a sudden says, I'm getting pretty old now, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Okay, Onesimus means profitable or useful. That's what his name means. And he, when Paul says, I have begotten him in my bonds, it is not his it is not his son, but it is his son in the faith. Begotten is that he has led him to the Lord and that he has become a child of God and a, and a brother in, in, while Paul was in bonds. So back in Rome, Onesimus shows up somehow and Paul hears his story and leads him to the Lord and then tells him, basically, you're going home. You need to go home. You cannot be the way, you cannot do this as a child of God. He, Paul continues in saying, which in time past was to you unprofitable, but now profitable to you and to me. Okay, do you remember Onesimus? And I'm going to go back a slide. Onesimus means pros, profitable or useful. But what Paul is doing is a play on his name and a play on words. And he says, in, in time of past, he ran from you, he's gone, he's unprofitable, he's of no value, and when he was there, he wasn't there wholeheartedly, or lest he would not have run. Wasn't happy. But he says, but Paul goes on to say, but now he's profitable to you and to me. And so that which was profitable in Nisimus at one point became unprofitable, but in Christ, he returned to usefulness. He, he referred back to being very profitable. And he says, whom I have sent again, you therefore receive him, take him to yourself. That is my own heart. He says, symbolically, I'm asking as if you would accept me openly with open arms with a heart. You have a heart to him and you receive him back. Whom I, he, Paul goes on to say, he says, whom I would have retained with me, uh, that in your stead or instead of you, he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. He said, I would have loved to have kept him. And that he is that profitable that just as you would minister to me and have, he, had, he I would keep him to be a minister of the gospel and to serve, to serve the Lord and to serve me and to serve others. So you have, a, you have an incredible comparison going on here. But what's interesting, the gospel does that to people. The gospel changes lives and can make us not just profitable again, but greater than we were before. So this goes on, but, okay, so they take a breath. Paul's taking a breath here, and hopefully Philemon takes one. He, Paul goes on to say this. I want to keep him, but without your mind or your consent, would I do nothing? I'm, I'm not going to keep him because I didn't ask you. He said, goes on to say that your benefit or your good nature should not be as it were of necessity or pressure or I got to do it, but to do it willingly. It literally, there's, there's this phrasing in here that says the pleasure I get from having Onesimus I owe to you is literally how it's reading here. That your benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly, I owe, I owe what he is to you. The pleasure of having him and talking with him. And so he says, I want, I, before, I, I would not ask that I get him unless I'd ask and get your consent with it, but I don't, I don't need him. I don't want him. He does not belong with me. He belongs back home, serving the Lord in your church. For, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that you should receive him forever. What a, what a great statement this is. He said, you've missed him for a while. He hasn't been on board. He departed for a while. But you know what? I bet, I bet if you take him back, He'll want to stay forever. Not now as a servant, not as a slave. And uh, the word servant is doulos. 
Uh, but then all of a sudden it changes and says, but above a servant, meaning a bond servant. That is somebody he will come back and that he wants to serve you, not that he has to serve you. And that's how it is in a Christian life. Our desire is that we want to serve the Lord, not that we gotta. I, I don't want to go to church because I gotta or to teach because I gotta, or to read my Bible, or to pray, or to be nice because I gotta. I should do all of these things that the Lord's called me and asked me to do because I want to, uh, because of what Jesus has done for me. Jesus became a servant, obedient to the cross, and died for my sins as he did yours, so that we, believing in him, can become a child of God and serve the Lord. When he says above a servant, he says beyond a servant. And that, that, that expression and that inflection on, and that is how that goes. That you could, he will come, he's, will come back beyond a servant, a brother beloved. Not especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. He said, you're getting something back that you don't, you don't realize yet. If you count me, now Paul in in some ways here st starts to put the clampers down on Philemon the just he's just going to have use any pool that he has that he would be received and he, he would not be killed thing to keep in mind runaway slaves Philemon had every right to ultimately kill him when he returned if you count me therefore a partner then receive him as myself. If you, if we're in this together, then just as if I showed up, you receive him. If he has wronged you or owes you anything, put it on my account. Paul said, I'll pay for it. If he stole money, and it's a good chance that he did because he didn't have anything to travel with. He says, I, I will pay you back. I, Paul, have written it, it with my own hand, I'll repay it. Albeit, I do not say to you how you owe unto me even your own self besides. Um, as I told you, Paul's going to use some pressure in this case now because he, Paul knows what Philemon would have in Onesimus. He sees it. and he, But Paul goes on and says, look, I, I just want to remind you how much you, you owe me. I've led you to the Lord, and I've been a mentor. I've helped your household. I pray for you. I stand beside you. Um, I've done you a favor in leading Onesimus to the Lord, although it wasn't a task or a, I gotta, but it was a privilege to be able to do that and see him saved. So he's just saying, hey, if you owe me something, I think you do, take them back. Yes, brother, let me have joy of you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Just as Philemon was refreshment to that church, he says, Philemon, I'm not in the church. I've never been to Colossae. But if you will do this, you'll refresh my heart in the Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll be part of that group. I will have be I will be encouraged. And so there's a reality and there's a follow through on this in two in these next two verses, and then we wrap it up in the last two verses. Having confidence in your obedience, I wrote to you, knowing that you also do more than I say. And so see Onesimus is coming back more than what he left, far more. And Paul says you know, I have confidence that you're going to do more than I've asked of you too, in that sense. But with all, prepare me also lodging. He says, get a, get a guest room ready for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you, that I'll be able to come see you. He never did. Paul died shortly thereafter, was killed. But he said, I look forward to coming. Prepare a place for me to stay. I'm on my way. Now, he wraps up the, the respect that he has, and there's friends that are mentioned here. But very, very important that I've not, 
I've not even brought up the word f forgiven and forgiveness. Um, let's finish this and we'll wrap it up with that and summarize it with that, with that theme throughout the book. There salute you Epaphras, my fellow prisoners, prisoner in Christ Jesus. He's the pastor of the church there. Marcus, or Mark, uh, Aristarchus, Demas, who has, has, after this, has forsaken the Lord. He wrote to Timothy. And Luke, the writer of the Gospel of Luke, my fellow laborers, says, greet them. And as it started, it ended with the grace, grace of God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit. Amen. And so as we head out and we end this chapter, and we go, God's grace began the book and God's grace ended it as it did with the book of Colossians and some of the others of Paul's writing. We all walk in grace. We, we wake up to the grace of God every day. Within our walk and within that space in the living of grace, there is one thing that, that drove this entire book and what was asked about forgiveness. It was all about forgiveness. Could Paul wrote to, to Philemon to take Onesimus back because, number one, Paul had been forgiven by the Lord for the persecutions that he did to the Lord and to God's people, the great vile acts that he did. But uh, on the road to Damascus, the Lord struck him down. He became a Christian shortly thereafter that, and as as nasty as he was, he became that and more dynamically in a soul winner for the Lord. Why? Because he was forgiven. And there was a principle, once we are forgiven by the Lord, we have to understand that we need to be forgiving of others, of other brothers and sisters in Christ. And yes, uh, forgiving of, of those that do not know the Lord. And so Paul wrote to Philemon, who had been forgiven, asking him to take back or to forgive Onesimus. And so there's, there's forgiveness, just it's a, it's a domino effect. And, and in reality, in our Christian life as individuals, we're, we are saved and forgiven of our sins and our sin debt by the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are times that we do not live for the Lord and we need to ask his forgiveness and a, and a starting anew, a starting afresh from that point on. And Paul did not excuse what um, uh, Onesimus did to Philemon at all. Not at all. He was wrong to do that. And Paul admits it and he, I'm sure he told that to Onesimus. But once again, Paul would, uh, would ask and was asking, would you give him a chance, another chance? Would you take him back? Would you forgive him and, and take him? So I heard, I heard a sermon one time. Actually, my mother sent me the tapes on them. And um, it was on forgiveness. And I had just been going some really, really, really terrible times. And... The statement, one of the statements the preacher made in this, he said, listen, if you've been wronged and you've been hurt, and you've had things taken from you, not just possessions, but maybe vocation or maybe whatever position, that he said, as long, he says, as long as you are not willing to forgive, whose slave are you? Because we tend to think, well, they owe, they owe me an apology. They, they owe it to ask me to for, that, that if I would forgive them and come to me and bow in tears and, and do everything. And we look, we look to that. We think that that is what is owed us. And I am extreme in what I'm saying, but you get the point. But what the preacher was saying was, the thing was, the, the, peop, the people that offend us and hurt us usually don't know they have unless we say something. So they just go on their normal life, la di da di da But here we walk around as a victim and not willing, and not willing to forgive them, 
And so the question that I was asked, and I'll say it again, whose slave are we? Who's really in bondage? Of course, it would have been me, and it, was, it would be you, uh, until that, that is rectified and that is, that is resolved. So that's the, big, that's the big thing about this book. And if you walk away the two things, walk away with grace, but walk away with forgiveness. And I guess if you had to pick one or other, go with the theme of the book of forgiveness and forgiving. Father, thank you so much for this, this great letter. It's the shortest one that, that Paul wrote. It's just one chapter, but it's got a, a, a paints a beautiful picture and tells us a true story about forgiving, about forgiveness, about the forgiven. And truly the title that I, that I felt led to, to give to this book, Forgiven and On the Way Home, is exactly, fits the picture of Onesimus and what's asked of, him, of Philemon. Bless your work and your, your church and your people as we seek to serve you and give us, give us a heart like Philemon. Give us boldness like Paul and give us a servant's heart willingly that really wants to serve the Lord. In his wonderful name I pray, amen.